Cecilia, hello. Cecilia is a medical anthropologist, anthrop anthrop how do you pronounce it properly? Yeah. Medical <laughs> so, anthropologist, yes. Anthropologist, yeah, whose work is focused on applied health research. And Cecilia is a senior research fellow in the Department of Targeted Intervention at University College London. And Cecilia is also a co-director of Real Rapid Research Evaluation and Appraisal Lab. And her work, she worked with a variety of healthcare teams from perioperative to cancer care. And um, I know, Cecilia, that a lot of your work is also focused on building capacity among healthcare teams. For instance, you're currently working, supporting a team of public health, a public health team undertaking uh, research on HIV. And um, I think this is very timely, this webinar. Um, we could be looking at a paradigm shift in the use of rapid uh, qualitative research in view of um, needing answers in, in the current pandemic to some very important questions. And um, you, for instance, you published a recent uh, paper on frontline healthcare workers' experiences with personal protective equipment during COVID-19 in the British Medical Journal Open. And um, this kind of work is, is, is what people are looking for, looking for answers uh, quickly. And um, I know um, you had, there is some uh, mention in the literature around this kind of work, um, the cheap and, and, and dirty comment. However, um, this presents an opportunity for uh, displaying the rigor that is involved in this kind of work. And um, we're delighted that you, you have joined us today, Cecilia, to share your expertise. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for, for the introduction. Um, well, I will attempt to share my screen with issues and because I've got a few slides. If you're able to let me know if there's any sound issues, I would really appreciate that. But I don't I think, think I you. can see the chat. All right. Um, well, thanks so much for the invitation again. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be here. Um, we normally look a lot at, at quests and, and, and follow publications um, because our involvement with clinical trials is, is quite a recent, um, quite recent involvement. So, so we like to learn from the experts and, and hopefully some of the, the tweaks and the, the adaptations that we've made to some of these qualitative approaches will be useful to you. So um, the idea of today is I've organized the presentation. So it gives you I guess quite, I'll spend quite a bit of time bringing everyone up to speed in relation to what we mean by rapid qualitative research. I'll tell you a little bit about the definition. We'll go over some of the, you know, most frequently used approaches, the key features. I'll show you what that looks like in practice. I'm going to try to give you a few practical tools that you could then take with you and potentially adapt into your own types of, of studies. And then I'll try to situate some of these tools and features within the landscape of clinical trials and how other teams have started to adapt qualitative research approaches uh, within within the, the context of trials and, and some of the you know quite minor pieces of work that we've done ourselves. And then I hope to close the presentation today with a look at, at challenges and, and, and leave, I guess, the presentation on a high note, thinking about some of the positives of, of combining some of these more traditional qualitative, but also infusing them, I think, with, with the, the creativeness of the more rapid approaches and, and what we expect to see in the near future. So as Maura said, um, I'm a medical anthropologist by background. I work with an amazing team that has expertise in various areas of, of the social sciences, uh, quite a multidisciplinary team. And um, we specialize in, in rapid qualitative research. And I'll come back to some of the reasons why we got involved with these types of approaches. But the first thing I wanna do is I wanna introduce the team through an animation because a lot of the work that I'll talk about is actually work that we've generated. So it just gives you a little bit more context in terms of how to interpret some of the, the papers that I'll discuss. Hopefully this works. <laughs> The Rapid Research Evaluation and Appraisal Lab uses research to improve healthcare systems, programs, and interventions delivered in time-sensitive contexts. REAL is a multidisciplinary team with expertise in qualitative and quantitative research. REAL delivers face-to-face -face and online training, carries out rapid literature reviews, quick appraisals, rapid ethnographies, and evaluations, 
and advises other teams or organizations on the use of rapid research approaches. Current areas of research include the organization and management of healthcare delivery, the use of rapid qualitative research in clinical trials, global health and complex health emergencies. For more information, please visit our website. So a little bit of music there after after lunchtime, hopefully waking everyone up. And um, so you, you a little bit about the team and what we're doing, um, but I think it's important for me to take you back a few years ago um, to to the reason why we actually became interested in this. And, and you know, this is important. I will come back to it a bit later in, in, in the conversation, but it's, um, it's just to give you a sense of why, why we do the work that we do. So, um, so I co-direct Real with another medical anthropologist. Her name is Ginger Johnson. She currently works for, for UNICEF. And particularly in her career, she's done quite a bit of work around um, the use of um, findings generated through uh, qualitative research design. So these can be used to inform epidemic response efforts. And a few years ago, we were doing some work um, during the Ebola epidemic. And, and, and we were doing a piece when we were asked to look at the relationship between incidence and, and gender. So looking at high incidence rates, particularly in, in, in the case of women, and trying to unpack, you know, what are some of the cultural practices? What are some of the traditional roles of women in, in, in very specific societies? And, and how does that contribute to, to a higher kind of incidence rate? Um, and it was interesting because that led us down a path of, of trying to review a lot of the, the more traditional anthropological pieces of work and to start interacting with, with colleagues who were doing work in, at, you know, in real time. And to some extent, the Ebola epidemic represented a shift in, in the integration of social scientists in the response. And I've put examples of, of a platform here that was used quite a bit um, in, in, in some of the resources um, where many colleagues were talking about the fact that, you know, at this point, uh, social scientists were to some extent taken seriously, integrated in, in many of the, of the the decisions, um, their work was used in, in planning, um, and, and it was quite an, an interesting shift. Now, at the same time, other colleagues were arguing that um, when social scientists were offered a seat at the table, many times it was a bit too late. Um, it um, their contributions were not actually taken into consideration in carrying out decision making. And, and another quite interesting uh, group of, of anthropologists at the time actually said, well. What's really happening is that many of us cannot respond to the time pressures um, uh, that, that are required by public health authorities so that we can deliver quite rich and meaningful pieces of information so these can be used to inform decision making. And also we're really failing in the way in which we are presenting those findings or communicating these findings. So a more traditional approach of let's say a monograph, a 50 page report that probably no one has the time to read would probably not be suitable within this context. So that led quite a few uh, colleagues to start rethinking the ways in which we design qualitative research, we implement it and how we share our findings. And it got us really, really excited and, and, and we, came, we became hooked to some extent um, with, with this kind of line of thought. And we put together this review quite early on actually trying to find out well, what are other qualitative researchers doing to be able to generate findings in a timely way so these can be used to inform changes in policy and practice. So that's where this review came. Um, it was the first one that we did together on this topic. And it was when we came across this question, this question has guided our work since then. Um, the question posed many, many different, many years ago, really, by Scrumshaw and Hutale, who are kind of the developers of RAPS, which are rapid assessment procedures, which I'll come to, where they asked, must one spend a year in the field collecting ethnographic data in order to make useful recommendations for a health program? And that's something that we come to quite often, thinking about, is it a matter of time? Um, in relation to the quality of the work that we can do. So as Mara was saying, you know, does time equal rigor to some extent, or can we actually develop high quality pieces of work where we can also generate findings that can be used within shorter time frames? So the big question is why does some research need to be rapid then? Bear in mind here, I've underlined, italicized the word some because I want to make a clear, clear distinction from the very beginning that not all contexts, not all topics 
are amenable to, to a rapid design, right? So we, we start this discussion off based on the premise that there will always be content and topics that where you will need a more traditional, longer pace of work to be able to uh, study it properly, yeah? However, having said that, there's many different ways in which you can design a study where you can still deliver findings in a timely way. And I really like this quote by McNall and colleagues that talks about the timeliness of information being as critical as its accuracy. And the reason why timeliness on many cases influences our ability to use research findings. So I've been saying this over and over, use them to inform changes in practice and policy. There is a way of, of using some of these approaches to bridge a gap, you know, this mismatch that has been identified between policy and evaluation, and I would say actually between policy and research in general, even practice and research as well. So bridging that gap and also considering the fact that some topics are time sensitive. So if we do not capture them in real time, there's richness, there's additional levels of detail that we will miss. All right, so what do we mean by rapid qualitative methods or, or, or rapid evaluation and appraisal methods as, as McNall and Foster Fishman have proposed? So no real consensus out there in relation to a key definition that brings all of these together, but quite few attempts to, to do this. And I think one of the, the most important ones is probably this review, which is slightly old now, but what McNall and Foster Fishman tried to do is they reviewed many different approaches uh, commonly used in, in, in more rapid and in, with a more qualitative design as well. Um, and what they found was that many of these approaches share the characteristics that I've circled for you here at the bottom. So these tended to be studies you know, rapid in terms of um, short duration, right? They talk about from a few weeks to a few months. We've seen some examples of, of things that are slightly longer and I'll come back to that, but because normally what they have is they've got a series of quite intensive periods of data collection with feedback loops um, organized um, as the studies ongoing, yeah? The studies tend to be uh, participatory, so that means involving members of the community or other stakeholders from early stages of design or even including them in the actual implementation of, of the study as well. Lots of team-based approaches, this idea that teams can cover more ground or you can bring in people with different expertise who might provide different layers of insight. Although having said that within the field, particularly of rapid ethnographies, we still see some examples of what we call more lone researcher models as well. And in most of these approaches, you are looking at an, an iterative design to, to research in the sense that you've got potentially repetitive cycles where you might be analyzing and collecting data in parallel, being able to identify emerging findings, potentially sharing those with stakeholders, using the feedback, bringing all of that together, prompting changes in your study design and starting all over again. Second question I always get is what do you mean by rapid, which is a very difficult question to answer because there's no real consensus out there. Um, so I've put here a few examples from, from the literature just for you to, to get a sense of, of timeframes proposed by some authors. Some of the reviews that we've done have also tried to map study duration, mentioned this one already, you'll see here very, very short and intensive pieces. Another review where we looked at rapid ethnographies, still lots of variation. You can see five days to six months, but we're starting to see some, some longer studies. And when we then go into the field of rapid evaluation, especially with rapid feedback and rapid cycle evaluation, sometimes we'll, we'll see the, the term rapid evaluation being used, but we might be talking about studies that are about maybe nine months or even a year long. How is rapid research used? So still uh, different combinations here in terms of what we've been able to map um, in, in the literature. So a rapid study carried out completely on its own, and, and that's quite common. But also I wanted to make sure that you were aware of these other types of, of combinations, which I find really interesting, particularly when we're starting to think about clinical trials and how a rapid study might interact with a trial in different ways. So a rapid study that might be carried out at the beginning could, could be more of an exploratory study, it could be in the form of what we might call a rapid appraisal, something that gives you perhaps a bit of a diagnostic that could then, the findings could then be taken and used uh, to inform a longer piece of work. 
Um, the open set type of design where you might be carrying out a longer study and as normally happens in research after the long study you've got more questions than when you actually began the study. So you might be interested in carrying out a rapid study after the long study to maybe tease out some of those questions in a bit more detail. And an interesting um, approach is this combination and running both studies in parallel. So a longer piece, if maybe you're running a rapid study in parallel to that, perhaps adding these feedback loops that you've heard me mention that I'll talk about in a bit more detail um, later today. Also variability and the types of uh, rapid research approaches that, that we see out there. I've divided them here for you in terms of rapid um, research and evaluation. Bear in mind that some of these distinctions are a bit um, arbitrary. So there's quite, quite a lot of cross fertilization over time. Many of these approaches are quite old. It's just to give you a sense of, of different areas, I, I think. Um, and one of the, the things that we've tried to do we've tried to, to categorize these different approaches in, in the form of a decision tool to help researchers, particularly those who, who are, are a bit new to the field, try to help them identify you know, what, which approaches are, are the most suitable ones when, when thinking about study design. And we've posed a few questions here. And at the end of the day, selection depends on many different things. Key ones would be the research questions, of course, guiding the study, the aim or the purpose of the study, the level of participation of, of study participants, as well as other stakeholders in design and implementation, how structured researchers want data collection and analysis to be. Is it a team based? Are you carrying out the study as a, as a lone researcher? And how is um, how are you planning to share those findings? Are you planning to share them in, in an ongoing way? This idea of sharing emerging findings through these different feedback loops, or are you thinking this is a study where you'll share findings at the end or one time feedback like we established here? Now, um, another thing that we've done uh, through this kind of constant mapping of the literature and seeing, you know, and also recognizing the history of, of these approaches, like I've mentioned already, um, one of the things that, that we do a lot in, in all of our training is make people aware that these are not recent approaches. We've seen examples of these, well, we've seen examples as far as the 1950s, but really lots of popularity of many of these approaches within the 1980s, and then various transformations of these over the 90s, early 2000s, and then we see a boom um, I would say probably beyond 2010. Um, and as Mara was saying, I think the pandemic has triggered a lot of experimentation as well. So within the next few years, I think some of our mapping will intensify to be able to capture some of the transformations that the, that the pandemic has triggered. But through this mapping, this idea of trying to identify what are the key features of, of rapid qualitative research. Now, many of these will probably not be a surprise to you, especially if you've been doing qualitative research for a while. Many of these, I think we, we could integrate into a more long-term study as well, but it's the combination of them and it's thinking about research in this more agile way that I think creates that, that particular distinction between these approaches. So I'll go over each of these because I also want to link these to particular pieces that we've seen carried out within the context of clinical trials a bit later on. So as you see here, one of the key, um, aspects and, and we saw this in, in the review by McNall and Foster Fishman this idea of, of iteration and we've tried to map where this iteration normally happens so we talk about different layers of iteration in qualitative research and previously I talked about one of the the, the features being this this early preparatory or scoping stage and what do we mean by this we see this mainly in rapid evaluations but recently we've been seeing researchers starting to adapt this early exploratory or scoping stage into other types of rapid approaches like rapid ethnographies for instance and we've seen rapid appraisals adapted as well to be able to act as this more diagnostic um, stage in, or a diagnostic tool in the study so a scoping study or, an exp uh, or this preparatory stage is, is, um, is a stage where researchers will um, collect, you know, that you might be able to use evidence that's already out there. You might be carrying out rapid, rapid reviews. You might actually be carrying out uh, a, a, an even shorter or an even more rapid study. Um, normally we try to combine some degree of a, a review of the evidence if that exists, depending on the topic. We might combine interviews with 
stakeholders or people who will actually end up using the findings of the study, a few informal conversations perhaps with part potential participants. If we're able to carry out observations to get a sense of, of the landscape, we will integrate that. Documentary analysis, documents related to the topic would also be useful here. If you kept thinking about carrying out a mixed method study, you might actually want to uh, review any available data sets at that stage as well. Perhaps you can do a bit of secondary data analysis if you can. The idea is to get a sense of, of, of that, that, you know, what's already been produced and what you probably need to integrate into your study design. The reason why many of these rapid studies have integrated this stage, you know, even though it it might actually delay the formal study start date. It's because for rapid study to actually work properly, the research questions need to be quite focused. And in order to focus a research question, you either have to have perhaps lots of years of experience working in a particular area or in a particular topic, or you might need to dedicate a bit of time and resource to the scoping or preparatory stage to make sure that 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 research question is focused and you've got a feasible piece of work, a study that you actually can carry out properly and um, within a short amount of time and can deliver high quality findings. So what we would normally do within that scoping study is use all of that information to define the aims, the areas covered in the study or the scope, right? refine our research questions and not only do this independently because the scoping study for many of these studies because we normally carry out rapid studies so that findings can be used to inform decision making a really important a key part of the scoping is to integrate um, stakeholders in decision making in relation to all the things that you see listed here so aims and areas research questions what the study design will actually look like the timeline, key piece of work, especially trying to understand when findings are needed. So that can be built into the study um, in the form of a dissemination plan, perhaps. And what are the final outputs, the different feedback processes that, that you actually want to integrate? And all of that, these discussions are facilitated by the research team, but the actual decision making um, is, is carried out by those who will ultimately be using the findings of, of your study. I'll put a little note here saying that many times a scoping study can also function as in a way of an evaluability assessment and that's used a lot in evaluation. But the idea here is the scoping study could also alert researchers to situations when a rapid study might not be suitable or appropriate. Yeah, so this idea that, you know, you'll do this, this really quick, but perhaps in that pace um, to prepare and to inform your design, and you might actually find lots of red flags in terms of, of the, the feasibility of that study. And there might be a point when you decide after the scoping study to abandon your plans to carry out a, a rapid study. So that's why this stage is also quite important. So another one of the features that I mentioned before was team-based research. And this also features in the definition that Mike Canal and Foster Fishman have, have proposed. And, and, and many of these approaches are, are team-based and I think that's, it, that's why it's really important for us to, to clarify what we mean by this. And the reason why rapid approaches rely on teams, like I mentioned before, many times teams allow you to cover more ground. Um, you can perhaps have multiple people collecting data in parallel. You can develop potentially larger sample sizes or cover more sites. But at the same time, uh, many of these approaches rely on teams because there's this idea that how you make up a team matters in relation to how you actually produce knowledge. So if you are developing a team, bringing in, let's say, researchers from different disciplines with different levels of experience, but also if you're combining in your team insiders and outsiders, right, members of the community, perhaps even stakeholders who will use the findings all as part of that research team as data are being collected and as data are being analyzed, all of their different perspectives will generate additional layers of meaning, increasing the, the, the kind of volume of interpretation that the, the team can carry out. There's lots of challenges with this and I'll come back to this when I talk about challenges as well, but one of the key ones is managing, you know, maintaining that consistency across multiple researchers. And several of these approaches have relied on more structured ways or templates, table-based methods. I'll give you an example of one that we use quite frequently to be able to ensure that consistency, the use of, you know, the, the, the ability to maintain more standardized approaches. Training has also been integrated into, into many of these studies of you know, the, the blue box that you see here is, is a really, really intensive training program that, that Brown and colleagues have developed for an approach called RARE. Um, where um, 
members of the team with absolutely no qualitative research experience can be trained in a few days and at least can assist with some of the field research, even though the actual research might be guided by um, researchers who, who specialize in, in more rapid approaches. Another one of the features was this idea of, of running different stages of, of research in parallel. And the key one is running data collection and analysis completely in parallel. And I've got an example um, of how this is done in practice based on a tool that, that we've developed um, a few years ago, which is actually an adaptation of another tool that was created around the 1990s. Um, and this is what we call the real rap sheet. So rap meaning rapid assessment procedure, which is one of the approaches that, that I've mentioned already. Now, the traditional rap sheet was actually a summary that was created at the end of the study, which was in the form of a table, and it just brought all of the study information together in a, you know, one page, and that was shared with, with stakeholders at the end. And as we were working through some of this literature and starting to implement some of these techniques, one of the things that we thought was actually, why don't we transform that original rap sheet into a working document? So something that we can use the moment we carry out that first interview, the moment we carry out that first observation to start helping us synthesize, summarize, identify the key findings that are coming out of the data collection and doing that in real time. So in a way, by doing it in real time, if we have to share emerging findings within a short time scale, we would at least be able to have a sense of the data that we're collecting but at the same time because we're already in quite Good contact with the data, we can see the summaries that are coming out. We could also identify gaps in data collection and we can come back to those as we're still collecting data. Another animation for you that explains rap sheet in a much better way than I just did. And then I've got a few examples to go through. <laughs> Real has adapted a tool originally used in Rapid Assessment Procedures, or RAP, to facilitate the collection and analysis of data in rapid qualitative research. RAP sheets are a table including the main categories of information collected in the study. These categories are based on the research questions, theoretical framework, or data collection instruments. As an interview is carried out, the researcher takes notes even if they audio record the interview. The researcher then summarizes the key findings from the notes and adds them to the rap sheet. When she carries out an observation or another interview, she adds the key findings to the same rap sheet. The researcher will do this for each data source using the rap sheet as a triangulation tool. The rap sheet will start to grow in length. Some topics will repeat themselves, but gaps will also appear. These gaps can be addressed as data collection is ongoing. Different types of rap sheets can be created, one for each researcher, each study site, population, or to capture changes over time. The rap sheet can be used to discuss emerging findings and obtain feedback from members of the team or stakeholders, prompting changes in the study design. If changes are made in the rap sheet, all researchers should make the same changes to maintain consistency. Rap sheets help create a quick summary of findings, but they also guide researchers as they set out to conduct more in-depth analysis. There are many creative ways to use rap sheets. Visit our website for more information. All right, so I hope that, that clarifies. Just to go through some of the steps here, this is just a, a tool to, to take with you and see if it if works for, for you as well. And there's many different variations of these types of templates and tools that have been developed by, by researchers working with more of these um, wrapped approaches. But just to give you a visual, so as the animation said, as you carry out that first interview, as you carry out that first observation, taking notes during both of those, creating a summary of those, popping those into that that real uh, rap sheet and then using that as a living document or a working document where if you're meeting frequently as a team and normally with our rapid studies we would meet uh, twice a week or once a week um, to discuss issues with data collection but also to start discussing emerging findings you can do that you can start to make sense of that data almost in real time 
you can use those discussions as a way of identifying gaps. You still have time to go back and make changes in study design if you need to. So again, coming back to that iterative cycle, right? But also if you've got stakeholders that require emerging findings, you can create a summary of the rap sheets, develop what we propose here as a one page summary or longer if you need to, where you can share findings um, with, with stakeholders almost in real time. Now, by sharing those findings, there's another kind of feedback loop added there where you might actually be getting feedback from stakeholders of, of, of areas that still need to be explored or where additional detail might be needed. And you still have time, again, that cycle begins again to go back, make those changes in study design, tweak data collection, and it kind of starts over again. Now, as an animation set, um, a key aspect um, of, of, of that rap sheet is, is just giving you a visual, even if it's a summary, visual kind of high level representation of what's coming out. Now, in order for you to be able to use that, that means that these feedback loops need to be embedded in, in your research design. And some of the things that, that, that we, um, one of the things that we do from scoping, like I was mentioning before, is we tease out a, a, at least a draft dissemination plan, and we agree that with stakeholders from the very beginning. And I've just listed for you here, I'm not gonna go through these, but I've listed a few questions that we ask ourselves about dissemination that allow us to, to generate you know, the, the information that we then need to, to inform that dissemination plan. So the goals, the audience, messages, the type of dissemination, the purpose of that dissemination, um, the budget, and, and if we are able to evaluate the actual impact of that dissemination. And we use that to, to map out a dissemination plan. I've just given you here an example of one that we did for a study that was about six months long. And key things for you to, to look at in this table, you see there's some early scoping and familiarization stages and that dissemination is, is built into those uh, as well. Really important to identify the purpose of dissemination. Are you only disseminating to share findings? Are you seeking to create feedback as well? Are you seeking to generate engagement and stakeholders? And that's why you're sharing findings quite early on. So, so quite a bit of, of uh, thinking behind generating that dissemination plan. But as the animation also mentioned, um, the, this, the real sheet is not only about generating um, those high level and quick findings, it could also be used as a way to guide more in-depth analyses. So we tend to use a rap sheet as an early coding framework sometimes, a way to guide us through potentially large volumes of data. And then we actually develop different subgroups, or at least identify different topics that we want to focus on. And we can go into the raw data and actually carry out a more in-depth piece of work if that is required for for our study. And we tend to combine the real sheets with other more other table-based methods like framework analysis, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with that approach. So we've been talking about scoping, looking at how we might design a study so that it could be focused enough so that it's feasible to carry out the study within a short time frame. We've talked about the importance of these iterative cycles. We're running these different stages in parallel. We're thinking about feedback loops. We've got a team that can allow us to cover more ground, to bring in all these different levels of expertise. And then we come to this thinking about dissemination as well where we're thinking about sharing our findings in various different ways. So one of the interesting things about many of these rapid approaches, and you heard me talk at the very beginning about one of the key barriers in share, making sure that research findings are used in a timely way it tends to be the way in which present, we present findings. And being trained as an anthropologist, you know, I'm a very kind of text-based person. And for me, it feels like if I'm not writing a long piece of work, it, it doesn't really pay tribute to the richness of the data. And, and many of these approaches make you think differently about how you communicate those findings so that they can be actionable, right? Easily translated into changes in, in practice and policy. So quite a few years ago, we started to innovate with our, our way of, of sharing findings. And a key contributor, a key enabler, I think, in that shift was a decision that we made as a team that if we wanted to take dissemination and, and kind of communication of findings seriously, then we needed to integrate the, those, the required expertise into the study. So you, you, you know, our team is made up of various social sciences and, and we tend to be, as I mentioned before, very based on, on text. And so we decided to integrate, to create a design team within our team. Um, at the moment, it's three designers, a graphic designer who does more of our 
a print work, an animation designer, um, and a designer that focuses a lot more on, on video. And they have been integrated as part of the team. So their time is costed as any researcher time would be costed. And they join team meetings and we, they are involved in all decision-making around projects. They deal with clients or other stakeholders. They make suggestions as we are developing study protocols and they will make us think completely differently about how we collect data, how we analyze data and how we present data. And so they've proposed various approaches um, for us to, to think about dissemination in different ways. Looking at, so if you see the top, what would that be, left um, infographic, which has mainly our three, this is our, the COVID-19 project that Mara mentioned at the beginning. The one at the top was used as a way of assisting us with recruitment. So you'll see it's an infographic that has the different methods that were included in the study, as well as where the study was being replicated. The study that we did in the UK was replicated across uh, about 15 countries and in a format called mirror studies that I'm happy to talk about that during the discussion um, session at the end. But used more as a, as a way of disseminating information about the study. The one that you see in the middle, linked to the same study, but this one was used as a way of sharing emerging findings. Um, and we use this as part of a member, member checking or member validation process where we actually shared emerging findings with, with participants and had lots of engagement compared to when we used to share 20, 30 page reports. So quite an interesting um, experiment for us. Then, as I mentioned before, we we used, uh, for instance, the real sheets as a way to map out these emerging findings. So as you see in this the infographic in the middle, and then we identified key areas of focus. So you see here in orange, it says PP. We've got a few lines here, just giving people a glimpse. But then identifying that area of focus in the real sheets led us to conduct a, a full piece of work looking at PP, which is the paper that Mara mentioned as well. And we developed, um, it's, it's a bit smaller, I apologize, but we developed this other infographic that you see here, which was designed more as a, as a visual abstract. So what it does is it transforms the key messages um, that came out of, of that analysis and then subsequently the academic paper. And it just presents them, I think, in, in, in a more summarized and more visually appealing way. And what we're trying to do with many of our papers, another example is the one that you see here at the bottom um, that was published in Qualitative Health Research. And you see the accompanying visual abstract, which is the one in orange. The idea of, of every academic paper that, that we publish to develop a, a one page more visually appealing uh, piece where if, if people do want to go ahead and read the full paper, there's a link at the bottom, they can always do that, but they can also get the main messages just by looking at that visual abstract as well. So different ways of disseminating, you've seen some of the animations and those are now being integrated into many of our projects. So instead of um, submitting a final report, we might be producing a one minute, one minute and a half animation on the findings. All right, so the topic of interest. What does this mean then for the field of, of clinical trials? And what I've done here is just really, really quick mapping of a few examples of clinical trials where we've seen some of the, some of these features that I've mentioned so far and some of these tools integrated into, into studies that are, are, are either um, a part of, of clinical trials in, in the form of a SWOT, a study within a trial, or have to some extent uh, interacted or informed uh, a trial in, in some way. So what we're seeing is we're seeing some examples where uh, rapid studies using different approaches have been used as more exploratory or preliminary studies that could inform trial delivery. Yeah, so looking at suitability of the setting, looking at potentially staff experiences, looking at any potential issues around trial setup, uh, anticipating potential barriers for, for recruitment, um, getting to know the context perhaps in, in quite a rapid way, and, and then perhaps using that information to, to contextualize the findings from, from a trial that might come later. We've also seen some studies where the, the rapid study is running in parallel to the trial, and it might be a, a longer study, but it will have more intensive uh, periods of data collection and build in these feedback loops. So emerging findings could be shared perhaps with a trial team, as in the case of this study, on, a, on an ongoing basis. So these cycles of data collection, analyzing in parallel, sharing findings with the trial team perhaps, and then initiating a, another cycle. 
we've tried to uh, modify that same approach, the rapid feedback approach that you saw before in, in a recent uh, feasibility trial. I've included a table here, it's got loads of information, but it's just to give you a sense of the short duration of the study. So we're talking about that five months here. But again, the different ways in which after each of these months, findings were shared with the trial team um, and how the findings were used or not by the team to, to make changes. I've just flagged a few other um, trials that we're working on at the moment that use a similar design where we hope to be testing out some of these, some of these approaches um, and, and reflecting on, on our practice. Oops. And a really interesting approach, many of you might already be aware of it, is, is the RAPACE approach um, that actually tries to combine the rapid assessment procedure that you've heard me mention quite a bit with a more traditional uh, uh, guess or conventional approach to, to research, which is um, clinical ethnography. So trying to adapt ethnographic research with, with RAPS. And you know, the combination of these is quite interesting because RAPS were actually developed by anthropologists as well. And they're what we might call the ethnography informed approaches. So there's quite a, few, a bit of synergy between them, but just highlighted a few characteristics here. And these I'm sure will resonate with some of the ones I've been talking about so far. So the idea that you will use a team and a team that combines different types of expertise um, and so that everyone can kind of bring that to the table when collecting and when analyzing data. There will be some, some type of training of team members early on to make sure that everyone is, has at least a, a, a similar level of, of, of experience before starting the study. Combining different types of data collection methods um, to you know, be able to generate different data sources and bringing those together um, through triangulation um, during uh, analysis. Again, this approach combines data collection and analysis uh, in the sense that they're both carried out in parallel and you've got these kind of iterative cycles planned throughout and short duration or rapid completion as, as another characteristic. So that's just giving you a flavor, but as you can see, what we're seeing in, in, in kind of the context of clinical trials is there's still the same integration of very, very similar features within that broader field of rapid qualitative research now being adapted for, for the needs of, of researchers working in trials. And I think a lot of the challenges that we've identified for rapid ethnography, so the, the, the table that you see here was, is actually a table that we developed in our review on rapid ethnography. So I've added a few things here that were, there might be additional challenges for rapid evaluations. And I think in many of these challenges will also um, appear when, when we start adapting these approaches for clinical trials. So it's definitely a trade-off, I think, when we're looking at shorter studies of shorter duration, especially with a qualitative design, there's a trade-off between that breadth and the depth of data, right? You'll have to make key decisions around design where there'll be you know, not necessarily a complete sacrifice, but where you have to be conscious of the fact that if you decide, for instance, to cover a greater number of sites within a short amount of time, you might not be able to get the same depth of, of information. And there's different techniques that have been developed to, to look at sampling, to look at high level sampling, in-depth sampling, combine different strategies to make sure that you are not losing the, the you know, valuable um, layers of, of insight that you're not missing out on capturing complexity or even you're not missing out on capturing changes over time that you still need to be conscious of that tension. Sampling has also been identified as a, as a challenge. There's this concern that because the study is rapid, researchers will tend to select uh, participants who are most uh, easily accessible or who are, um, who are more, I guess, potentially more used to, to participating in, in research. But there's other techniques that, that um, rapid qualitative researchers have, have tried to develop to make sure that sampling can, can still take on a, a, a purpose of, for instance, approach where you might be developing a, a sampling brief or a sampling framework early on mapping out different groups that you think need to be included in the sample and using that as a guide, a quite a flexible guide, but still a guide as, as you're collecting data. I've touched on, on the use of, of teams of researchers already, the need to train members of, of the team who might be a bit more, more junior. And there is this discussion within the field around, you know, is it better to have a lone researcher or work across 
multiple um, or have a team that has that has multiple researchers, right? And and there's issues there around consistency. Many of these approaches have relied on more structured forms. So the real sheets is an example. The fact that each researcher might be working on, uh, you know, summarizing data in, in the form of a table. This idea that if one researcher makes a change to that table, that that should be done by everyone to to ensure that that consistency. Um, there's other approaches that have been developed as well for the, the stages of data analysis that are also based on, on the use of templates for, for tables. I've mentioned framework analysis as well. Um, a few other things that I think are might be relevant um, for, for work carried out in trials is also this idea of delivering timely findings. Um, and, and you know, we've seen this in, in some of the applications around, you know, are you delivering findings, let's say, to a trial team and how are you deciding when when's the best time to do that, the format um, that, that is preferred, and, and how do you build those those feedback loops from, from early on to make sure that you you've got uh, what we might call, I guess, quote unquote, good enough data and deciding when you've got good enough data so it can, can actually be, be shared. And another key point, especially coming from, from the field of rapid evaluation, is this idea of how do we translate those, those quite rich and sometimes quite complex findings into actionable findings, right? Those that can actually be used to, to inform quick changes. So lots of challenges, but at the same time, lots of interesting things to, to think about and, and seeing really, really important examples of, of the application of rapid qualitative research in, in clinical trials and, and thinking about, well, how can rapid qualitative research in clinical trials actually generate additional contributions to our you know, wider debates within the field of, of, of more applied qualitative health research? All right, I feel like I've talked um, forever. <laughs> I don't know if, if, if there's any questions. Yeah, just, we, have, um, we have a lot of information on the team. Th thank you, Cecilia. We have a lot of questions here, um, a lot of interest. Thank you. Um, the, for one of the questions here, one of the earlier questions that came in, um, and uh, Louise acknowledges that it's possibly a rhetorical question. Do you think ethics and research and development have caught up with the need for rapidity? And what can we do to collectively raise awareness? I think that is an excellent question. And I feel like sometimes I spent my life um, communicating with, with ethics committees as a way to um, communicate exactly that, that point that you've made. I think that, um, no, I don't think that, they've, that we've been able to synchronize um, timelines and pace. I think that many times ethics committees continue to create delays. We've got a piece of work at the moment where we're working with our local research office to try to, we, we had a short piece that we published where we, we did a rapid appraisal of the research office during COVID-19 because they had to create lots of internal changes to rapidly review and set up um, studies, in, of course, mainly including clinical trials, but, but also other studies that were more about health services research, for instance, and that they had to shift their ways of working. So we did a piece trying to understand, okay, well, what did you do during that time that allowed you to work rapidly? And what are some of those changes that you would keep moving forward? Um, and, you know, there were different things, but one of the key ones was running some of these stages all in parallel. So quite similar to that rapid qualitative design work where I was talking about combining those stages, um, they, they adopted that and they had more team-based working where they could all, for instance, discuss a study and everyone was involved in that same discussion and that allowed them to you know, stop working in that more sequential and linear way that they were used to working and actually bring all that together. Um, I guess the issue is how sustainable those changes are and to what extent they would be able to keep them and, and keep up that, that rapid review and setup process. I think there's also for rapid qualitative researchers, I think we face kind of a, an additional um, complication or additional difficulty. So any qualitative researcher, I think going through uh, ethics kind of review uh, will have to deal with an issue around translating a qualitative design to a committee that might be used to the more clinical trial type of, of design. And we see this in forms that sometimes aren't suitable for the type of work that we do. I think someone working on a rapid qualitative research design has an additional 
layer to that, not only translating the, the more qualitative um, angle, but also making sure that people understand that time is of the essence and the more that that, that process generates delays and the less significant that the need for the study will, will be. So yeah, I don't, I'm sorry to be kind of the bare bad news. I don't think they've added, I don't think they've, they've synchronized in terms of timelines. I think there's lots of work to do. One of the things that we're looking at at the moment to try to inform changes in kind of in the UK is looking at what some organizations like Doctors Without Borders, for instance, have done where they've created their own quite rapid review uh, mechanisms in the case of emergencies and seeing if there's anything we can capture in terms of the work that they've done where we could potentially create different tracks within ethics committees where a study is, is deemed um, important and, and the basic, you know, time sensitive, right? If it's not carried out at that particular time point, then it will miss really important. Really, yeah, uh, it's a very imp important consideration, Cecilia. Um, a, a few questions about the RAP template and uh, where it's available and any, any, any link to um, rap sheets exemplars that, that you can share? Yeah, so our, um, our website has, um, has some resources. There's also, if I'm just gonna go back, sorry. There's a paper that the one that we published, um, this one, carrying out rapid qualitative research during a pandemic, um, talks about how we use the, the sheets in, in that study. And it's got that diagram that you saw on the other slide about all the different steps. We're in the process of writing a fuller one uh, where we really show you all the different examples of how we built the different sheets. Um, but for, in the meantime, I think those would be the best ones. And also happy for people to email me and I can send you examples that we use in the when we teach in, in the training. So I've put some of the training here in case people are interested um, in a couple of these, we go through step-by-step. Step. How do you design yeah. it? How do you tweak it? How do you use it? Thank you. And another question um, around a publication that you mentioned using rapid qualitative research and trial, trials and, and the reference, was that, was that something you had provided in the talk or? Uh, does it say which one? So there's these two where we've seen that they are used more as exploratory. So this is kind of pre-trial to some extent, trying to inform. Um, this one is running kind of in parallel. So this is a rapid feedback evaluation, which is quite good. Okay. Um, our, this work is under review at the moment, so I don't have a reference for it, but if it's accepted, then happy to share that. Our website's the best place to, to get all the, the publications as they come out. And then this is a really good paper as well, the repeats one, and I've added just the title here, but I'm happy to connect yeah. people to references. And, and, and thank you to Louise who has shared some further information on ethics and um, oh, issues around that. So thank you, Louise. And just another question. Um, there's a question here about, can you use the data for a secondary analysis? Is that possible? Um, after the rapid um, uh, study. Do you know if that's used in, um, if that's in relation to the real sheet, if the real sheet can be used? Yes, yes. Oh yes, yeah. definitely. So we've, um, so at the moment, for instance, we just finished a two week really intensive project where we were basically handed a massive data set of qualitative data, all in different sources that we need to, to first of all, um, clean and, and organize and our whole remit was can you do secondary data analysis on this kind of big qualitative data set um, we used a version of the real sheets as a way to get a sense and familiarize ourselves with the data and kind of pick out some high level themes but at the moment we're working on a on a, um, an analysis approach that is going to allow us to so for instance with the the project that we did with frontline staff we ended up having 145 interviews um, which was big for you know, mm. qualitative research terms. And we used an approach where we combine the real sheets with this framework analysis, which is basically translating pages and pages and pages of interview transcripts into a spreadsheet. And at the same time, you know, the real sheet gives you that high level finding, but the framework analysis brings you back to the raw data, right? So you're constantly doing kind of that dual exercise and you're not losing that um that detail so i've um i can put it in the chat if that's helpful we've got a paper that describes that to some extent and we're in the process of writing another one but definitely if you have data already 
um, qualitative data, then it's quite easily translatable into these table based methods. Okay, thank you, Celia. Just a few later questions have come in. Um, a question on um, if the findings from rapid qualitative research are not in depth, why do we need rapid qualitative research rather than quantitative research or pilot quantitative survey? Interesting yeah, question. It's like, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I wouldn't say that they're not in depth. I think it depends on what the purpose of the study is and how you decide to share the findings. I've seen really rich and in-depth pieces of work developed with a rapid design. So I wouldn't, first of all, I think it's important to clarify that. Um, I don't think the, the, that you can make a decision around which one's better, qualitative or quantitative. I think both types of designs answer different questions, right? Mm -hmm. So we always make this distinction between, you know, a quantitative design will allow you to answer a question of how much or how many potentially. But a qualitative design will allow you to answer questions like why and how. Yeah. So I think, and that's why we do lots of mixed methods work as well, because sometimes we might want to answer all of these questions. And so you need a mixed methods design. So within a survey, for instance, a survey that will produce quant data, there'll be, you know, you'll be able to ask quite specific, perhaps quite close questions, and you'll get a data set that reflects those questions. Um, but I think there's still value depending on, on what your research questions are and what the ends of the study are to, to look at the generation of qualitative data that will allow you to answer different ones. So yeah, I don't I think research design is based on, on the questions that you want to ask and then how you actually decide to answer those from um, if you're going for a qualitative design, and like I said at the beginning of my presentation, there'll be topics and there'll be contexts where a rapid qualitative research design will not be appropriate and that's a decision that you want to make early on and you know one idea is to use the scoping stage that I was talking about that preparatory stage to actually make that decision you know yeah. is is a rapid design suitable or, or not and just a final question before we close and um, another very interesting question around um uh, the challenges of interpreting findings as multiple researchers come from different perspectives, you know, you know, and, and there might be a positivistic um, ap yeah. approach there. And um, any, any thoughts on that, Celia? Definitely a challenge um, and lots of negotiation as well around, around meaning. And we've got a model in our team where many times we also have lots of clinicians who join the team to learn about qualitative research. And you know, it, many times the, the perspective is incredibly useful, but sometimes it also takes a lot of discussion and, and negotiation to actually reach a point that both kind of the social scientists and as well as the clinicians on the team are, are happy with. And I think the value there is, is, is all around how you manage a team, this intensity I was talking about of the frequent meetings and, and enabling those discussions in, in you know, in, in a good kind of working environment. Um, and, you know, to date, we haven't had any, any major issues. I think we've always reached a, a point that we've all been happy with, but yeah, I think it's looking at it as a process, I think is, is probably the most important bit. Well, thank you, Cecilia, and thank you, everybody, for um, attending the session and the and the very interesting questions. And I know I'm very interested in this as another opportunity to, to broaden um, my own, um, you know, scope, my expertise, and and the scope of the type of research that I do, Cecilia. So, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, so we'll sign off. And um, I just check there's a few more questions coming in before we sign off don't want to miss anything that is there uh, let me see now um yeah i think i have them all yeah i have all the questions that's great yeah so so th thank you cecilia and um no thank you for the invitation and thanks yeah. to everyone for their time yeah, okay thank you very much thank you much everybody for attending